insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 49, Defiant Behaviors. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my brilliant and beautiful but not defiant co-host, Madison Whalen. Hello. How are you doing today, Maddie? Pretty much like I am every other Friday. Every other Friday, I well, see. Well, every Friday. Well, last Friday, we like preempted the entire show to talk about how bad your week was. Was it that bad again this week? No, okay. Every other Friday. Uh, oh, so you're, it's only terrible every other Friday. Okay, okay. Let's move on. Okay, so I, I'm just asking a question. That's okay, all. okay. Okay, so this week we are talking about defiant behavior. And this actually came up. Uh, there was a conversation that we had had at work and one of my colleagues at work um, was telling a story about how, you know, how, for lack of a better word, defiant their one child was and how they didn't listen to anything and, you know, they would violently slam the doors on our faces and stuff like that and, and it was something where... Um, it was something that I had no experience with because uh, neither you nor your brother ever had any kind of behavioral issues like this. Um, and I know some parents who have had children that were like this and had these kinds of issues, but um, the parents kind of brought them on themselves. Um, so... <sighs> In doing research for this, I found out that there was um, various trigger points for this kind of behavior, and there's a legitimate medical diagnosis for it in some cases as well. So we'll do what we normally do. We will define what we're going to talk about first off. Then we will talk about suspected causes of the behavior. Uh, we'll look at risk factors that are involved with it. We'll look for the signs and the symptoms, uh, and then we'll talk about strategies for dealing with a defiant teen. What do you think? You ready to get going? Why not? All right. So for the purpose of the podcast today, we're going to define two different types of defiant behavior. One is just defiant behavior, and that for that we went to a, a very well-defined um, terminology on a individual's WordPress site here, and the links are in the notes. And they describe defiant behavior by saying, adolescence can be a difficult phase in life to navigate, defying the wishes of their parents or other authority figures, and testing limits is a normal part of growing up for teens. Youth are trying to figure out who they are, establish their independence, and express themselves. Unfortunately, in some teens, this process can cause them to act out in angry, argumentative, spiteful, or rebellious manners. But just because it's normal behavior doesn't make it acceptable. So let me ask you, based on that definition, do you think you exhibit any of those tendencies? Well, no. I don't... I'm not normally rebellious. Um, I don't really act I don't act out I know I don't I'm not rebellious in really any way um I'm I listen to what you guys say I do what you guys want me to do and um yeah 
So it, it also speaks to the fact that youth are trying to figure out who they are, establish their own independence, and express themselves. Do you feel the need to do these things? Do you know who you are? Do you not need to establish your independence? And if you do, how do you do it if not through defiant behavior? Well, I think I've pretty much established a I've pretty much established sort of a good base on who I am. Um, so if I was ever defined, it's not because I'm trying to find out who I am. I'm pretty settled on who I really am. Um, for my independence, um, I couldn't, I can't say I would ever really be defiant in that because I gained a lot of independence when moving into the middle school where, you know, I get home earlier than you guys and... On some occasions, I have to cook my own dinner. Right. So how do you, and that's a very good point, is that you're you're expressing your own independence by, by being self-sufficient. That's way, one way that you do it. Um, speak a little bit to how you figure out who you are. Like, like what makes you who you are in that you don't have to be defined? How do you, def how do you discover that? I think the way I discovered that was thinking about mainly what qualities I could have to describe who I would really be. Like, am I smart? Am I an athlete? Do I have, am I, what gender do I want to be? Am I happy with the gender I have now? What is my personality? Do I want to be kind? Do I want to be evil? Do I want to be rebellious? That kind of stuff. Okay. And are there things in your life that help you come to those decisions? Well, yes. I mean, you figure I'm a pretty solid straight-A student. Um, if you do say so yourself. If I do say so myself, I suppose, if you want to add that in. Um, I'm also in the advanced math pro, the advanced math class, and I would definitely say I am quite smart. Um, I can definitely confirm that I am not athletic in any way um, possible. I get tired real easily if I have to run long distances. We can clearly see that from when I have to run to get for when I bring my trumpet home. Right. We both can under, I can de totally see that. Also, I'm not really good at any of the games because sometimes I'm not really I don't go for the ball for most of the games. Right. I normally let other people do it. I'm definitely not an athlete, so I know that um, factor. I guess just seeing my daily average schedule and situations that are thrown at me and how I react is how I kind of figure out who I am. Because I know I'm a straight-A student. I'm a, I'm a kind person, not an athlete, and I do have some problems with my brain anxiety wise so it sounds like you kind of define yourself by your positive traits you know your strengths yeah um, and you don't have the need because you know let's be honest you've got a lot of positive strengths you don't have a need to act out as in some kids who do have defiant behavior issues yeah interesting okay so the second part that I wanted to define here is the actual clinical condition, which is called Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Uh, and this definition comes from uh, valleybehavioral.com website. They say Oppositional Defiant Disorder is a childhood disorder that is defined by a pattern of hostile, disobedient, and defiant behaviors directed at adults or other authority figures. ODD is categorized by children displaying angry and irritable moods, as well as argumentative and vindictive behaviors. While all children will display some type of defiant behavior throughout their growing years, children suffering from ODD will display such behaviors more commonly than that of any other type of behaviors. For these kids, it can seem like nothing can be done to make them happy. 
These children will not only do things to purposely cause conflict or to purposely annoy the people around them, but they will oftentimes place the blame on others. Um, I'll ask you again. Do you exhibit any of those uh, symptoms? Um, pretty sure I don't. Um, if I ever, if I ever do anything that is wrong, I always try to own up to it. I don't try to blame others for it because I need to own up to my mistakes. Um, I also don't really act to, I'm not, I don't argue that much. We only have like, I mean, we have play unless arguments. you count the play arguments we have. We have debates. We don't have arguments. Debates, yeah. But the only time I could ever think that I would have like issues would be when I'm either stressed or having an, a mental breakdown. Where I remember in sixth grade, those were kind of common for me. I would just frankly be annoyed at everyone around me, and I'd just have to rant on about it. And I think that was like. I think that was, like, how I show, exhibited some divine be, defined behaviors. I mean, I still listen to what you guys said, but um, I ha did have emotional breakdowns and just didn't want to be around anyone. Yeah, and you've come a long way since then. Yeah, I can definitely handle my stress a little better. So based on these two clearly defined terms, do you know anyone? Or are you associated with anyone? Have you encountered anyone who... Uh, exhibits either of these um i don't really get to know people enough to know that i just i mean based on my experience with them not really but there are a bunch of rebellious kids in my school because they're kind of teenagers and they need to get it out and honestly i don't understand why they're they even have the confidence to like talk back to the teacher which i know i will never have right or even the idea to even do that, I'm confused with that. I don't know if that's defined behaviors. It's just like they're just being rude at that point. I don't know if it's And anything. I would tend to agree with that assessment. I don't know if it's anything medical-wise or if they're just doing it because it's just what, they, what um, normally occurs or if they're just doing it because they think, hey, it's funny and they're going to be the class clown. Yeah, I think a lot of it's that, too. Yep. So we'll come back and we'll talk about some suspected causes for this type of behavior. So the specific causes that might be attributed to the onset of ODD cannot be narrowed down to any one specific factor. It's widely believed that a combination of factors work together towards causing a person to develop the symptoms of operation, op oppositional defiant disorder. So here's a few symptoms, um, and they break these down into three categories. So one is genetic, and they say it's common for children who are diagnosed with ODD to have family members who also suffer from, a, from various mental illnesses. Um, now, you are aware we're constantly kind of pointing out, you know, the genetic aspect of things. How do, how do we relate to you with the genetics of what you get from mommy and daddy are give some examples um well we normally base it off of well it's normally based off of actions and feelings like i scream at technology like you do i kind of have the same point of view on life as you do like yeah. we're like semi-positive but also semi-negative right like and we also take it to the point of physical appearances too yeah you know like we always say you've got mommy's nose yeah and like that's um ongoing thing that never stops but that's a good thing because mine's broken so you didn't want mine anyway yeah i also have your eyes and well although, give them back i need them <laughs> and although people may not know it but i also have your hair technically well yes <laughs> he used to have just saying he used to have blonde curly hair okay he, he used to have I, I used to have very hair. long hair actually yeah and look at you now so and so they go on to talk and they say that such illnesses can include mood disorders uh, personality disorders and anxiety disorders um, so you talk about having anxiety issues um, I don't know well I can tell you that 
I don't recall ever having anxiety issues myself, um, nor do I recall that being a trait in my family. I don't know if mommy ever did. Um, so it's also important to note that th while genetics certainly can play a part in this, it has to start somewhere. So, so defiant behavior itself is common, but the ODD itself can be passed by genetics, but it doesn't have to be by genetics. Ah. So one of the other aspects that they look at for this is physical. So they say the presence of oppositional defiant disorder traits have been linked to the existence of abnormal amounts of certain brain chemicals. So we know that certain uh, mental illnesses can be due to imbalance of chemicals in the brain for various reasons. We talked last week, or we talked about comfort foods last week, mm -hmm. and, you know, chocolate. So chocolate triggers a chemical reaction in the brain. Some people, it doesn't. So they have a slight imbalance in their brains where it doesn't. Other people, it triggers too much, and that's where you tend to get eating disorders. So... For someone who chocolate is just so good that they get addicted to it because of that endorphin feeling. You can imagine what the, some of the side effects of that are. Yeah. So outside of the genetic side of things, there's the physical side of things. Um, they talk about brain chemicals known as neurotransmitters. They work towards helping to keep the brain chemicals themselves balanced properly. So sometimes those things go a little off balance, and it could be from any number of things. You could have had um, a head injury if you had suffered concussions in the past or something like that. Um, you could have situations where you might have multiple sclerosis, sclerosis that can cause lesions on the brain that can then cause issues with chemical imbalances and other complications as well. Now, they say that when the imbalance exists messages are suddenly unable to communicate properly within other aspects of the brain. So it kind of your brain is broken down in the different sections and different sections process things differently. So what happens is, is your speech processes in one part and your vision processes in another. And if you have a breakdown of these chemicals, they're not communicating correctly. So there's messages that are being missed or misinterpreted by your brain. So that's kind of one of the physical things that they talk about. Mm. Um, the other thing they talk about is environmental. So they say envi and env the environment in which a person is raised can have a significant effect on whether or not he, may, he or she may fall into the symptoms of oppositional defiant disorder. If a child is surrounded by a somewhat chaotic home life where violence, arguments, and other forms of general discord are prevalent, it would not be unreasonable to assume the child could begin acting out as a result. So if you live in a, in a house where your mom and dad fight constantly, or if you live in a house where you ha don't have a mom and a dad, you only have one mom and parent, so you just had a mom who not only was trying to raise you, but was also trying to earn money to keep the house up. You know, that itself can create a lot of stress. Fortunately, I don't think you run into that here. Uh, mommy and daddy, I think, get along pretty well here. And I, I think as a result, you see a lot of that. You know, sometimes you, you see affection there that you might not feel comfortable with, you know. Uh -uh. But, you know, mommy and daddy love each other. And we show it, and I think it's important that you see that and you see how, you know, we function. And we function as a team, Mommy and Daddy. But you don't always have that. Like, you know, there are a lot of kids out there that don't. Growing up, I had a mom, you know, my mom and dad stayed together, but they probably shouldn't have because they argued constantly. Um, and I'll be honest, that had an effect on me to the point that I did act out at one point in time. I don't think it... It caused ODD on my part, but, you know, when, when you see your dad yell at your mom a lot and, you know, you were raised to respect your mom and, and to protect your mom, it, 
it has an effect, you know, and one day my, my dad happened to be yelling at my mom and it was, you know, maybe the 30th time that I was there and I was kind of shocked that he would do it while I was there, but it got to the point that I didn't want to stand up. I didn't, I didn't want to just sit there and, and take it anymore. So I stood up for my mom, you know, and I defied my father and my dad was a, I wouldn't say he was violent because he didn't hit my mom and he didn't hit us regularly. Um, but he threatened violence a lot and he tried to use that to intimidate people. It's kind of funny to think of that because my dad was like five foot four and maybe 150 pounds soaking wet. So he was not a very intimidating looking individual, but he had a temper. And he tended to use that temper to intimidate people. And for the longest time, it worked on me until, I don't know, I guess I was 16, 15, 16, somewhere in there. And uh, my dad, you know, was yelling at my mom and living in that environment for as long as I did, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I had a about a foot of height and probably about 120 pounds on my dad. So I was a giant compared to my dad. I got my size from my mom's side of the family. Genetics again, okay? <laughs> and uh, and I got between my mom and my dad and I put my foot down. I wasn't going to take it anymore. I wasn't going to let him treat her like that anymore. And that was, that was the pinnacle, I think, of my defiant behavior. Before that, I was, you know, that mild-mannered, you know, young man who did what he was told and kept his head down and, and didn't defy his parents until I, I saw that my dad was, was out of control and he was out of line. So, again, that's an environmental trigger there, and that's what got me. Mm. So... So I don't think you've got a genetic, any kind of, you know, genetic tie. Um, to the best of our knowledge, you don't have any physical issues. You never, you've never had a, you know, head injury or anything like that or any kind of illness that would have affected your brain function. Uh, and I don't think you've got an environment that would have, would be conducive to that. No. Nope. Um, which I think explains a lot of the reasons why you're as well behaved as you are. And I don't. You know, I like to think you don't give us reason to discipline you. Like, you know what the rules are. And I don't think the rules are overly demanding, are they? No. And you abide by them. And as long as we, you know, you do, I won't lock you in the, uh, <laughs> the laundry don't room like bring, I did with the cat. Don't even bring that up. Do not even bring that up. The cat didn't listen to the rules. She threw up <laughs> on your desk. That's it. And you locked her in the laundry room for over an hour. Oh, my goodness. For over an hour. That's terrible. Anyway. I'm just glad you treat me better than you treat the cats. Oh, uh, I'm yes, because I'm terrible with the cats. I know. <sighs> so, anyway, just to recap, some of the risk factors associated with ODD is... Family discord or family arguments, uh, dysfunctional home life, um, exposure to violence, history of mental illness within the family, exposure to substance abuse, which we don't have that here. Neither mommy nor daddy abuse drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, inconsistent parenting. Now, this is one that we didn't talk about, which I thought was kind of interesting. So it says inconsistent discipline or inconsistent interaction. And this is one of these ones where my dad was kind of guilty of this too. Like my mom was always there. Like you, you could, she was the most reliable person I ever knew. And she would stand by you and help you and, and give you the last penny in her pocket if it, if it could help you. And my dad was very distant. Like he was, he was never really around. He worked a late, a third shift. So he slept during the day. And then on the weekends, you know, he was one, he was an alcoholic. So he was pretty much drunk all the time, but kept to himself, fortunately. 
And two, his hobby was his yard when we were growing up. So if you didn't work with him in the yard to garden, then he didn't have time for you until something went wrong or you did something bad or, you know, you had a bad report card. Like, like he was never there to encourage you, but if you screwed up, he was there. So he showed an inconsistent, um, parenting technique there. Mm. Like he can't always be the bad cop, right? Yeah. Cause at that point in time, you just, it wears thin. Yeah. So you got to be there for the good and the bad. And even the bad, he was very selective in, in what he thought was bad. You know, he thought a bad, a report card that wasn't above a certain level was bad and you'd get punished for that. But like you could stay out till like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning and he wouldn't have a problem with that. So it was kind of weird, like what rules he chose to, yeah. to enforce. And then the last risk factor they talk about is abuse and neglect, which we've already discussed. So anytime you see anything like that in any of your friends, it might be a, a warning sign if they talk about stuff like that, that they might need, they might need some help or even just someone to talk to. So just something to keep an eye out for. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about the signs and symptoms when we come back. So there's three types of symptoms to be aware of. One is behavioral, the other is cognitive, and the third is psychosocial. Okay. <laughs> what? Like you stopped and you were expecting me to say something and I I was waiting for you to ask what psychosocial was because you don't you're not very social, so I was just really? kind of an inside joke. Anyway. So we'll talk about behavioral first of all. So um, anyone who loses their temper easily or they throw repeated temper tantrums, that's a sign. So if your friends tend to do that, they snap easy. Do you have any friends that, that have a short fuse, we used to say, or a short temper? Mm, not that I know of. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Um, anybody that you see at school who tends to be short tempered like that? Mm, no, not really. Good. Um... Arguing or fighting, you know, verbal fighting or physical fighting uh, is another sign of people that suffer from this defiant behavior in ODD. Do they fight a lot in school? Um, no, there was only that one fight at the end of the year in sixth grade. That was like the only time. See, I find that amazing because there were constantly fights in my school. Like, I didn't, I, I didn't go to school in a really rough neighborhood, but like... You know, there's always joking around, pushing and shoving, and, and invariably, several times a week, somebody always took it too far and wound up getting into a fight. Yeah, the only thing that really happens at my school, people just, you know, like you said, jokingly push each other around, but that's it. It's never gone far enough to where there was an actual fight, at least not that I've heard of, but, you know, I haven't witness any fights well that's good yeah because i was usually the one who got involved in the fights but not because i was the antagonist i was the one trying to break things up mm -hmm. and i got i got punched in the face a few times doing that yeah uh the other is refusing to follow rules do you have a lot of rule breakers in school uh yeah give me an example like Sometimes in ELA, when we're told to do, like... Don't name names, though, obviously. I won't. In my one class, um, we were when we work on our centers, uh, some well, some of the kids, let's just say, don't want to do it. And they don't. Okay. And, well, yeah. We're technically told to do them because they're quiz grade, and if we don't finish them all, we're going to get a lower grade than a hundreds so i always make sure i do them um but there are kids who like will either like we have like a certain amount of time to get each center done and if we don't finish in that time we have to do it for homework and some of the kids don't really take it seriously like they'll like wander around work on it a bit and when the time's done they don't they barely have half done 
So in situations like that, do they accept the consequences of the lower grade, or do they argue over that? Yeah, they literally accept the consequences, and I have no idea how they can do that. They accept the fact they're getting low grades. That's interesting. I know. I don't know how that happens. Yeah. The next one that they talk about, and I know you've got an example of this, so don't name names with this either, is deliberately acting in a way that will annoy others. Oh, So great. tell us about that. Give us an example of that that you've seen. Well, I've almost every time in gym, if there's the one kid that's there constantly, I can just, they just constantly annoy me and I'm pretty sure a lot of others. So it's not, they're not just targeting you. They're just being annoying in general. Yeah, like one, they don't really try in gym and in Frankly, it's annoying to watch because, like, they whenever they're the goalie in any situation, they, like, almost all the time, like, the other team's going to score on them. And I'm just like, you're not even trying. I try and I still fail, but I at least look right. like I'm trying. Like, when we had our one football thing, like, we were throw. All we had to do was throw the football correctly to the other person. And I literally saw that she, like, that person didn't get the catch the ball once and, like, didn't even take it seriously. I could guarantee they were the only person who got an F in that test. Now, do you think they were doing this to be annoying, or were they doing this just out of a complete lack of physical ability to do the task? If thing is, I think it's a little bit of both, because... She's a kind. She's a pretty rude person. Well, they they are a pretty rude. Sorry, I. I you didn't name I'm names. You're okay. This. It's okay. You didn't name names. I, I'm bad at this. They are a really rude person. I have to change next to them in gym, and constantly they're just like, with all the other girls I have to change next to, they are just constantly talking. Also, they like. I'm normally done by the time they're just starting to get starting to get changed like right. they talk way too much with the others i'm just now have you ever confronted this individual with some of these complaints well the um, there was only one time and it wasn't even like a real confession so my one friend so i have a friend in gym class who i sit next to in our squad spots and so does this other kid so so this other so this other kid was asking my friend a really weird question what time do you go to bed and i'm just like i'm just telling my friend don't answer it and like that that apparently triggered them and literally like all of a sudden made them annoyed at me mm. like told me to mind my own business and called me something similar to a rat then when i wasn't looking luckily my friend was looking she literally well you know she told you you were number one yeah with her hand yes okay so yeah i mean these are typical behaviors and i'm sure a few more of these candidates are going to fit that mm. um blaming others so something goes wrong you know you did it but instead of taking the the responsibility you blame someone else for it do you know anyone who does that um I think it's probably happened at one point, but I just don't really remember. Um, I know none of my friends have ever done that. Um, See, and, and in this case, it's I think it's the reasoning behind that. Like some people, they blame others because they don't want to get in trouble. And that's natural to try to protect yourself. Yeah. In the sense of defiant behavior, I think when people do that, they do it not to protect themselves, but to get someone else in trouble deliberately. Oh. So that's kind of the distinction there. Ah. Uh, how about deliberately acting in a way that will... Oh, no, I'm sorry. did that one again. <laughs> that was really bad. We did it twice. Yeah. Uh, being unwilling to compromise or negotiate. Um, I know none of my friends do that. I'm definitely not one to do that. I always want to come up with a compromise in any way. Um... Good, good. Well, this, these are just things that you, you need to look into, need to be aware of. Yeah. 
uh, blatant hostility towards others. It sounds like that one individual may have hostility towards you for reasons that you, at this point in time, are unaware of. Yeah, I mean, like, in the very first month of school, like, she told my one new friend to, like, also this was the exact same friend, mm -hmm. um, she told my one friend to get away from me because she considered me annoying. So not only was she hostile, she was trying to solicit others to be hostile towards you, too. Yeah. So that one is another one here where if they're willing to destroy friendships, whether it's their friendships or someone else's friendships. So this person seems to be exhibiting a lot of these symptoms. Uh, and the, again, these are just behavioral symptoms. Uh, the last two on here are being spiteful and seeking revenge and then blatant and repeated, repeated disobedience. Um, well, so, I definitely say the blatant disobedience. The repeated disobedience is definitely what can describe that person because, like, I think on Thursday when we had gym, like, I thought they weren't here that day, but apparently they came in late. And I'm just like, we're already in the middle of the game. Like, in my brain, I'm like, we're, in the in we're already in the middle of the game and you just show up randomly? Like, seriously. So... <laughs> You really don't like this person, do you? Not really, no. So let's talk about cognitive symptoms. Some of these you might be able to notice in these people, too. All right. So the first one is frequent frustration. So does this person strike you as being frustrated by everything? Every little thing bothers them? Well, not every little thing, but they are definitely um, kind of frustrated when they talk to the others girls okay. in the locker room. They... They constantly, like, for some reason, I don't know why, but these girls have never told on her because for some reason she constantly curses at them. And I'm just like, why has no one told the teacher yet? Like, the first time she ever really did that to me, I immediately went up to the teacher. As you should. Yeah, honestly, like, I think they consider it play fighting, but all I'm hearing is just they generally hate each other right so the next one that they talk about here is difficulty concentrating um and if you don't have this person in any of your classes other than jim you might not notice that well i kind of do notice it she okay i think the reason why they um always well don't ever are it's hard for them they don't Sorry. Slow down. I know there's a lot to get out. <laughs> <laughs> I think the reason for why people are always able to score on that on them is because they're constantly distracted and they oh. don't pay attention to the actual game because they genuinely don't care. That's a good good point. And even though I really don't care about playing the game, I still pay attention to the ball because I don't want to look like a, I don't know, an idiot in front of my team. So... The last cognitive symptom they have here is failure to, quote, think before speaking. Do they have a filter on what they say, or does the first thing to come to their mind just blurt right out of their mouth and then they say inappropriate things? Yeah, that's pretty much them. Like, you can like, they never shut up, okay? That's all I'm going to say. They okay. never shut up. All right. So the next section that we have is the psychosocial symptoms i don't have a definition for that so we're going to kind of have to play this one by ear oh boy so the first thing is difficulty making friends do they have a lot of friends um they seem to be talking a lot to people so yeah. okay well it sounds like they don't treat their friends very well yeah not really no how about a loss of self-esteem do they seem like they have low self-esteem no not really okay uh, are they persistently negative in their outlook on life and the things they say? Well, not that I know of. Okay. I really don't get to know them as a person because I really don't want to. And do they consistently have feelings of annoyance to others and everything around them? Mainly to me, yes. Okay. But do other people tend to annoy them too? Yeah. Okay. So this person might be suffering from this. and And, you know... Bear in mind, if they are, they can't help it. Yeah. Okay, so 
as difficult as they may be to, to deal with, they might not be doing these things deliberately to be spiteful or to hurt you. They might not be able to, to help themselves. They might not even know that they have an issue that they need to get help with. Mm -hmm. Just keep that in mind and, and kind of have a little bit of sympathy for someone in that situation. Yeah. So we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some strategies for dealing with defiant teens. So a lot of these are tips for parents who have defiant teens because mm -hmm. uh, it's things that only parents can do. So the first thing they talk about is to tie privileges to good behavior. Um, and we do that you know, as parents in general because we like to reward you for good grades or doing your chores or whatever it is. And I think that's just a good life lesson. Uh, they say when your teen might consider what your teen might consider as necessities are really privileges uh, that they should have to earn. Electronics, money, driving, time with friends are all wonderful things that your teen may be allowed when they're behaving appropriately. Um, so, like, you get these things. Obviously, you're not driving at this point in time, but you get these, th these things uh, as well. Do you think mommy and daddy are fair in how we give you these types of rewards yeah i mean i'm gonna use the example of technology you guys tell me an hour before bed turn off your technology and i've actually come to cope with it because i actually go downstairs with mommy and watch part of a movie for that hour and it's actually and i've actually gotten used to it and um it's not only um, keeping me off technology for the hour before I have to go to bed, but it's also having more quality time with my mom. Yeah, and I think that's actually been working out really well. I know mommy's been enjoying that time, too. I've really been enjoying it, too, because I get to, cause it's not every day I get to like just sit down with my mom and watch a movie together. I mean, we occasionally do movie nights, but we haven't, I don't remember the last time we've done one. I think it was when we were on Disney and we were just watching movies we hadn't seen yet i think you're right yeah um but which wasn't that long ago but yeah but still we as a family we probably should need should sit down and, and do at least one movie night per week yeah but very good point the next thing that they talk about here is avoiding repetition for some reason it seems like uh most parents at one point or another resort to repeating themselves i don't repeat myself do i no. I don't think so. I try to stay fresh. Yeah. Nagging your teen or reminding them, you know, that laundry misses them or oh, something. Oh, yeah. That's the only one that uh, I can think of. Reminding them over and over that if they don't do something, they will be grounded usually doesn't work. And I don't threaten you, right? We're just friendly reminders. Yeah. Except they do end up getting a little annoying, especially if I'm just, like, laying in my room just doing stuff I normally do. And then I, you just... Like, and you know, total confession, I annoy you on purpose just because I get a certain sense of satisfaction from it. Great. Uh, many teens just, uh, many times, it just encourages defiance and steals your authority. Instead, of give directions one time only, offering only one warning, and then follow through with a consequence. Now, I'm going to delve off into a different topic a uh, different direction here on this one um you probably never heard of the art of war by sun tzu it's a it's a book on strategy okay and there's a lot of life lessons to be had in this book and the one lesson that i'm thinking of at this point is uh sun tzu who was a general in the chinese army says that if the commander's orders are not clear. It's the commander's fault. If the orders are clear and they're still not followed, it's the soldier's fault. And to illustrate this very well in the book, he talks about um, working with the emperor and the emperor's favorite servants. And... He has all these female servants, and he has the, the lead servant who's in charge of all of them. And he, the general, was trying to convince the emperor to let him command his armies. And the emperor thought he should do it, not the general. 
So he said, all right. The uh, general says, all right, if I can get your servants to follow my orders on the battlefield, will you believe that I can lead your troops? And the emperor laughed and said, sure, go ahead. Good luck with that, basically. So he took all the, the servants and he told them what to do. He said, you know, you're going to, here's a staff. You're going to stand at attention when I say attention. So he, you know, steps back up next to the emperor and says, all right, attention. And they all laugh and giggle with each other and they don't take it seriously. So he walks up and he takes a staff and he says, okay, that was my fault. I didn't explain what you had to do correctly. He says, when I say attention, you stand up straight, you hold your staff in front of you like you're ready for battle. Perfectly clear. Steps back up next to the emperor, says, okay, attention. And they all laugh and giggle again. Well, at this point in time, he knows they know how to do it. They're just defying him. Mm. So you know what he did? He walked over to the lead servant, took his sword out and cut her head off. Then they all took him seriously. Now, granted, that's an extreme. Yeah. But the point of the story here is that if I ask you to do something and I don't tell you how to do it correctly, then it's my fault for not telling you. Mm -hmm. But if I tell you how to do it and the instructions are very clear, then it's your fault. So if you fail to do it again, I have to then have consequences attached to it. So in the case of electronics, maybe I take your, your iPhone away for a day or two. Or maybe you can't play video games or you can't go see your friends. Something like that so that you understand that when you don't abide by the rules, that there are consequences. And that's basically the rule. We're not chopping anybody's heads off here. We don't yeah. do that, so <laughs> we're, we're okay. Yeah. But this is a this is like a book of military strategy that's like three thousand years old. So it's not like this is a new concept. This is a lesson that's been passed down for a long time. Um, the other thing they say is um, have enforced consequences, which we just talked about. Have a plan. So when you teach, when your teen acts defiant, the situation can be very emotional. So you don't want to act emotionally. I tell you a lot of times that when you get emotional, you need to, you need to back that down because you're going to do something that you're going to regret. Yeah. So one of our techniques is to count backwards from 10 to try and just calm down and look at things. And then count backwards in Spanish. Exactly. Uh, then they say your teen may be angry and their behavior can in turn make you angry. Unfortunately, emotional gut reactions generally do not help calm the conflict. So it's best to create a strategy beforehand, plan out what you're going to say to your child ahead of time before he or she acts out again, deliver your message in a simple, clear, and calm answer. So a lot of times when I get agitated, I have to walk away from what I'm doing Otherwise, you know, I do stupid stuff, and we yeah. don't want to do that. Praise good behavior. I think we do that, right? Yep. It's important. You don't necessarily have to give a reward every time, but every time you do something that, that's good, you need a pat on the back, right? Mm -hmm. That's really how, how to encourage and, and get people to want to do things correctly. Uh, teach problem solving. This one is huge, I think. Mm -hmm. Despite what your teen may say, they usually do not prefer to deal with their problems alone. As a parent, you are your teen's teacher, coach, cheerleader, and disciplinarian. Part of your role is to teach your teen how to solve their own problems. So let's talk about that for a minute. So how do mommy and daddy teach you how to solve your own problems? Tell us a little bit, a little bit about that. Well, you first let me rant about what I'm, what my problems are, and um, once I'm done ranting, you all, you always make sure to tell me not to get worked up over something like that because if you get worked up over something, you tend to not think clearly. Right. So the thing you need to do is before you're about to act up, you always tell me to take a deep breath, and um, and Go to the logical side of things. Right. Work the problem. You know, every problem has a solution, and you cannot come to that solution if you're agitated or emotional or upset. 
So when a problem happens, you kind of need to wash those emotions away and let the logical side of your brain come out. Um, and one of the things that we do, ironically enough, to teach you problem solving is this podcast. You know, we started this podcast almost a year ago um, because you were having some issues. You know, sixth grade was kind of a tough year for you. And, and I didn't know how to cope with it. You know, we would sit down, we would talk, we would hear how your day was. And our talks weren't helping. And I thought, well, you know what? Let's put it in the form of a podcast. Let me go do the research so that I can at least kind of put things into context for you. Now, this isn't an issue that you deal with, but, you know, we've talked about a lot of things, stress and depression. And, and you know, the first thing we do is we define what it is so we know what we're talking about. We talk about what could cause it. And then ultimately, we always talk about what we can do to solve it. And th that is really part of the scientific process. You know, so we apply that to these podcasts and you can apply these to any issue that you run into. Define what you have, identify what the symptoms of, of those, you know, issues are, and then identify solutions for them. It's really those three simple steps. Mm -hmm. Focus on one behavior. If your teen is acting defined in a number of different ways, it will be difficult and exhausting to try to address all the problems at once. Instead, and this is what we tell you before, instead focus on one thing at a time. This is a, another problem solving thing. If you got a big issue you're dealing with, a big project, you know, a big assignment, whatever it is, take that, break it into small parts and deal with it in smaller parts. Pick your battles. You've heard that one before. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't always try to correct every, every defiant behavior. Stay respectful. You know, you don't, you're the adult, you know, we're talking to the parents in this case here. You're the adult here. You want to make sure you treat your child with respect. Uh, and that's one thing. Whenever we set boundaries with you or we set rules, we don't set rules for a 13-year-old. We set rules for an adult that you're mature enough to follow. Um, and mommy and daddy always try to treat you with that same respect. Um, we do it in a nourishing and enriching manner, but ultimately a respectful manner. We don't tell you, go do something because we said so. If we ask you to do something, I have no problem explaining to you why we need you to do it, what the value of it is, or what the necessity is, and why you're the right person for it. And we do that out of respect. Yeah, and luckily, for the most part, I think I can definitely understand things that I have to do that are generally necessary. I mean, the only... I mean, cooking, for example... Um, is not necessary, but it's always nice to, for you guys to come home and I've already got dinner started. Yeah, um, and I think both mommy and I appreciate everything that you do with the cooking, and you're doing a very good job of it, to be honest with you. Yeah, you kind of just, you kind of uh, messed up my pattern with the air fryer, but I'll get on track. <laughs> well, that was, that was, you know, mommy got that one as a, as a Christmas present from work, so. Yeah. It just opens up new possibilities. We step outside of our comfort zone a little bit. Yeah, I and I completely understand why I need to do laundry. Um, like, if I don't do laundry, we're probably not going to have clean clothes. And well, you're not going to have people that want to be near you because you're going to smell. Yeah, um, especially when I have to uh, clean my clothes from gym because, right. you know, that's that a whole other thing. Pretty bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the last thing that they talk about here, which is one that... You know, we we tell everyone in our podcast, you know, we're we're not experts on all these things. We're not trained. We're not clinical. Get support. You know, we try to sort of steer people in the right direction and help people out. But ultimately, if what you're having is a problem that's too much for you to handle, don't be afraid to identify that. There are tons of resources out there that you can go and look at and get help for. So there are the things that we can do to help out. Uh, we will come back with uh, shout outs and closing remarks, and I do have some a programming note as well. Okay. All right. Go for your closing remarks and shout outs. All 
Alrighty, so it might be a bit hard to talk to any teens who are going through this disorder because they don't really know what's going on. The best thing I can say for them is to notify if you have any of these symptoms or you think you have any of these symptoms. If you really don't know, always make sure to like ask a parent or a friend if you think you have any of these. And if you do, um, then you might want to consider seeing a professional or talking to your parents about it or getting it notified. For the parents out there, um, there are going to be plenty of kids who can either have these disorders or just find behaviors in general, and all I can really say is try to be prepared for it. Also, don't be overly demanding, because that doesn't help anyone. Um, you need to be firm, but fair. Very good said. Well said. Shout outs at all? Um. No? Not this week? Not really. Okay. Eh, nothing wrong with that. We don't always have to have shout outs. Yeah. I don't really know a lot of people. So, uh, quick programming note. Um, this week we actually are filming two episodes this weekend. We'll be filming episode, hopefully we'll be filming episode 50 tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, we do have a special guest. Sam, your brother, will be on the show Yay. Uh, tomorrow, time permitting. And then next week, we'll go live again. Uh, well, we'll be live tomorrow. I just don't know exactly what time. Uh, next week, next Friday, we'll be live our regular time. And we do have another special guest uh, next week as well, assuming schedules work out. Wow, so, two weeks. Two weeks. So before we go, quick contact information. We always love to hear from all of our viewers or listeners. You can email us at comments at anything, insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can see our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. Uh, you can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Our website has links to all of our audio and video as well as show notes and transcripts at www.insightsintothings.com or our audio at podcast.insightsintothings.com. And we also have also make sure to check out our two other podcasts, Insights in the Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights in Tomorrow, hosted by you and my brother, which hopefully we will also have done um, on Saturday, uh, assuming everything goes to plan. Yep, we're and, scheduled for Saturday afternoon. Yep, and remember, it's our monthly podcast. The other two are weekly, so don't forget to tune in for that. And I think that's it. I think that's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.